Hello everyone, and welcome back to our genetics lecture series with VCU's Partnership for People with Disabilities and Center for Family Involvement. Once again, if you have not watched the previous two lectures, I recommend you watch those first. We will continue to build on the topics we talked about in the first two, and the goal of this lecture is to give you a better understanding on how we read DNA. We will also start to talk about the different kinds of mutations that happen naturally and cause many disorders we know of. Finally, if you have any questions about today's topics, any other topics we've covered in the series, or have any feedback on how we can improve, please leave those below. We would love to hear your input. Just like we did in the second lecture, we'll go through a review of last lecture's terms. Last lecture covered inheritance, which we didn't really have a definition for, but is the passing on of genetic information from your parents to you. Next, we have the pedigree, which is like your family tree. A pedigree can show all of your family members and typically follows one or more disorders. Pedigrees can give insight as to if there are genetic trends in a family or if a disorder was passed down through generations. We can follow disorders through alleles, or the versions of the genes that we have. We typically discuss two types of alleles, dominant and recessive. Since you have two alleles, this can create multiple combinations for each person based on what alleles you inherit from your parents. Some disorders are dominant, where one dominant allele is enough to cause the disorder, while there are also recessive disorders where both alleles must be recessive to cause the disorder. Remember that these are not the only way that genetic disorders occur, but this is how many of them work. Today, we will start with how we read DNA. It's similar to if you were to learn a new language with a different set of characters, like Russian, Japanese, or Arabic. We need to know where to start and what direction to read. Here is the same image from our first lecture with some directions on how we read DNA. DNA has what we call a 5' prime and 3' prime end. These terms come from biochemistry, but it's not really that important. The important part is just knowing the difference between the two. Think of the 5' prime end as the start of a sentence and the 3' prime end as the end of a sentence. We always read in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The red arrows in this image show that direction, and the bases on the right of the slide show that the order that they would be in if we were to read this quote-unquote gene. So the top strand in this image would read ATG, GAC, GGA, and so on. This part of genetics isn't the easiest to understand, so we're going to try to avoid some of the very confusing details, but still learn about the general concept of how we read DNA. If we want to understand how the bases A, T, G, G, A, C, and so on are read, we have to look a little bit deeper. This will be like the game of telephone many of us played as children, where information is passed on from person to person. However, we know genetics is super complicated, so we'll talk through this first with an example. We're going to look at this through the context of ordering a coffee. But again, genetics is always more complicated, sadly. Um, so we have to do a translation in genetics. Imagine you didn't speak English, but instead spoke German, and you needed to order a coffee here in the United States. How exactly would you accomplish that? Well, first you need to know what you need to say. Here I've written out that same sentence in German that's an order for a small coffee. To place that order at a coffee shop, it would need to be translated into English. So now it says, in English, I want a small coffee. Now think about the barista that will make the coffee. What's the important information in that sentence? They're probably going to assume that the person ordering is getting the coffee for themselves, so that portion of the sentence is kind of unimportant to them. The most important and most relevant information for the order to them is the number of coffees, the size, and the type of coffee. In this specific example, that would be a small coffee, meaning one drink that's a small and a regular coffee. To expand on this, ordering coffee gets more complicated as the order gets larger. Imagine you were ordering coffee for an office full of coworkers. You need the important info such as how many total drinks, the size of each drink, what specific drink each person ordered, the extras like cream or sugar added, and even the cost. This gets to be incredibly complicated, but it can result in almost infinite possible combinations. Still, it comes from the base bits of information, the number of drinks, size, and specific type. It's when you add these multiple layers that it creates a very specific outcome. This is almost how it works with reading DNA and translating it all the way down the line into what the gene creates. We call this the central dogma of genetics because of how frequent this is discussed and how genetics constantly returns to this single process. We first start in one language, the DNA. We first translate from DNA to RNA, and this is actually called transcription, but we're not going to worry about that. 
This is similar to our translation from German to English, the changing of those languages. The RNA, or the, our phrase in English, is then interpreted and helps make our product the protein or order of coffee. On the right of the slide, you can see the RNA, our second language, English, spread out vertically in a helix. You might be thinking of, you know, what makes RNA different from DNA? They're mostly similar, but it's the bases that differ. DNA, as we discussed in lecture one, is made of A, T, C, and G. RNA, on the other hand, is made of A, U, C, and G. So essentially, it's just the T becomes a U. You will also see that there are brackets called codons. These are like those specific changes on the coffee order for the office that I mentioned in the last slide. Basically, each codon is its own instruction to the cell, just like each word in our coffee order is its own instruction for how to make that certain drink. Once the codons are chunked like this, the protein, or coffee order, can be made and completed to make our protein. One more thing to mention about these codons is what their limitations are. This will be a limited view of them since you can get into crazy detail with them, but you're now looking at a codon table, a cheat sheet, with our RNA on the right side still. You will notice that the codons in the table, just like the ones in our RNA strand, are in chunks of three. This is important because this is how our cells understand the orders. These chunks of three separate each specific instruction, almost like every tree of letters is one word of instruction for our coffee order. I wanted to point this table out because it will come into play when we talk about mutations, but there will only be a couple of major takeaways from this for now. The biggest is that the codon table is like a stoplight in a lot of ways. It tells the cell when to start reading and when to stop reading. You can see one codon of letters are green, and that is the order to start building the gene. When a cell sees that trio of letters, it knows that is the starting point. You will also see three codons in red, and those are the signals to stop. Simple enough. In between those orders, the gene can be made up of any of these other codons. Just like how we can have infinite possibilities in a coffee order for the office, you can have infinite possibilities on what codons make up a protein. The important thing to watch is what happens when a mutation happens, changing the codons being read. The other major takeaway is that you can take many paths to get to the same order. For example, we see that there are three different orders for the same stop order. This means that if any of those are to come up, the product stops being made. And in our example of the coffee order, this would be like telling the barista, and the final drink that I'm going to order will be blah blah blah. And another little side note is our cell is really, really good at listening to these stop orders, and that'll actually come into play when we talk about mutations. The multiple ways to get to these different orders are what we call redundancy, or a built-in and purposeful way to still reach the same endpoint. Redundancy will be important to be aware of for some of these mutations. Speaking of mutations, let's talk about exactly what they are. A mutation is when a base is changed from its original form to a different form. Different mutations have different impacts. Over time, every person gains mutations by our cellular machinery being imperfect. This is not to say that our cells are bad at doing their job of reading DNA and replicating cells, but they do make mistakes. The average cell makes an error in one of every 10,000 replications. At this point in the presentation, I've said just over 1,500 words, so we wouldn't even be 20% of the way there, and there's a good chance I've already mispronounced a word in this presentation by now. Overall, based on the total number of cells that we have and every factor to take into account, we get around 175 new mutations every generation. However, not all mutations are equal. You can see in this slide that there are two major categories, point mutations and frame shift mutations. These two categories each have three major types of mutations, and we will look at each specific example of them in the next slide. To look at mutations, we will rely on a sentence and alter it based on how certain mutations happen. You can see on the right that I've included, included this cute little picture of two cats playing in a hall. So, an accurate sentence for this picture would be, the gray cat ran down the hall. Now, we know that this sentence makes sense based on the picture, since we can see that the gray cat ran down the hall. But what happens when a mutation happens to this sentence? First, we will focus on point mutations. The first is the silent mutation, which changes the sentence to, the gray cat ran down the hall. What changed? Well, the word gray changed from an A to an E. Does that change our sentence? Not really. You can spell it either way and get the same outcome. This is how it works in genetics too, because of the redundancy that I mentioned earlier. We have multiple ways to get to the same outcome, 
so the spelling in this specific scenario doesn't really matter too much. Next, we have a missense mutation, which changes the sentence to the gray cat ran down the ball. We can see that hall is changed to ball. This sentence is coherent, yes, but there's not a ball in the picture. This changes the sentence and its meaning, just like how a missense mutation would change the protein and how it works. Overall, missense mutations change just one, one letter in the codon, but change the outcome or how the protein works. Finally, we have nonsense mutations. This changes our sentence to the gray cat ran down the. If you didn't have the picture or the original sentence, you might be thinking the what? We see that our sentence got cut off early, and this is exactly what happens to our proteins when this mutation type happens. Remember how I said our cells are really good at listening to when to stop? Well, this proves that exactly, since the protein got cut short by that order. If you cut off an important part of the protein, it can cause a really big change. For frame shift mutations, we have additions, deletions, and duplications. For these examples, we will need to operate under the premise that the words all stay the same length, since that's how codons work. First, we have addition mutations, and you can see that our sentence is all jumbled up. Why? Well, the letter O got added before the word cat. Since gray was already completed, the O had to be put at the start of where the C would be in the word cat, and it shifted all the rest of the words. Now, we can't read the rest of the sentence. This is similar to how it works in deletions, but instead, we obviously delete one of the letters. This example has the T in cat deleted, and once again, it shifted the entire sentence. In proteins, the adding or removing of one base changes how all the codons downstream are read, so you can imagine the large effects that these can have. Finally, we have duplications, where an already present letter or base gets repeated. This, again, shifts everything in the sentence, so now it's incoherent. Overall, frame shift mutations are messy because they change how everything past the mutation is read, while point mutations change one letter but leave the other words or codons alone. One thing to note is that with frame shift mutations, it is entirely possible that an entire word or codon is added so the sentence is still understandable. An example of this would be a duplication reading, the, the, gray cat ran down the hall. It still makes sense, and it doesn't change everything downstream, but we can't ignore that the adding of the extra the in the sentence makes it a little awkward to say. Hopefully today's lecture has given you some more insight as to how genetics works. Our next lecture will expand on our material even more, and we will talk about how genetics play a part in different disorders. We'll look at how some are tied to one gene, while others are tied to hundreds, and why it's so difficult for the world of research to find answers when we know so much about genetics already. If any of today's material didn't make sense or wasn't clear, please feel free to leave a question below. We would love to hear your feedback on this series as well to continue and imp to improve it for the community. I want to thank you once again for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this third lecture.